Everything has an expiration, whether it's a bottle of milk or a pair of jeans that we uh, purchase or a car that we buy uh, that we pay so much for and make so many payments and then it's to the junk pile. And so it is even with our life. Our life has an expiration uh, to it and what we're learning from the Ecclesiastes is how to outlive our life. It took Solomon all of his life, the wisest man who ever lived, the most wealthiest man who ever lived, and then he, when he looked back on his life, he began to gain perspective. So you say, how can that happen? Well, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning at verse number 1, if you'll open up your Bibles, open up your heart to hear from heaven, and if you'll stand with me, we're going to read these words together. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning at verse number 1, we're going to read through verse 8, and then verses 13 and 14. Solomon's coming to the end of his life. Notice here uh, the metaphors and the poetry that he's using to describe aging and to describe death. He's not meeting any disrespect because Solomon himself is experiencing this as he's writing this, but he's giving us perspective. He says in chapter 12, verse number 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of adversity come and the years approach when you'll say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light are darkened, the sun and the moon and the stars and the cloud uh, goes after the rain. He's speaking here of the fading of eyesight. On the day when your guardians of the house tremble and the strong men stoop and the women grind grain cease because they are few and the ones who watch through the windows dimly, speaking here about the shaking of hands and the it's folding over of the shoulders. The doors, verse 4, are at the street. They're shut. And while the sound of the mill fades and the one rises at the sound of the bird and all the daughters of the songs grow faint. What is he speaking of? That loss of hearing. And yet even though your loss of hearing, you're having insomnia. Seems like any little bump in the night wakes you up. He says, and they're afraid of the heights and the dangers and the road. The almond tree blossoms. What does that speak of? Gray hair. Do we have any gray hair uh, here today? The grasshopper loses its spring and the caper berry has no effect for the mere mortal is headed for his eternal home. And the mourners will walk around in the street. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before 
the silver cord is snapped. That speaks about the heart. The golden bowl is broken and the jar is shattered at the spring and the wheel is broken at the well. And dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Absolute futility, says the teacher. Everything is futile. And when all this has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. What's the, what's the conclusion? Fear God and keep his commandments because this is for all of humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Father, we pray this morning your blessing upon the reading of the Word of God. And I pray now, Father, that you would give your Holy Spirit as we expound and make clear what your Word is saying. For we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Remember, notice in verse 1, you may want to circle that word. Remember, it's an imperative Remember means to call to mind, bring to your attention. Don't forget, don't neglect, don't be mindless. Remember what? Your creator. Who's your creator? He's the one who formed you in your mother's womb, knit you together. This creator is the one who made you in his very image. In the Imago Deo, you're in the image of God, the creator. Remember now this creator. Why is that so important while you have opportunity? He says here, in the days of your youth, while you're young. Why is that? Because as we have just read, aging comes. Here he is speaking almost in surreal language, almost in apocalyptic terms here about the, the sun growing dark. What is he speaking of? He's speaking about the aging when your mental faculties are no more. And you can't see, you can't hear, you can't have opportunity. You don't have ability to do that. Remember today, wherever you're at, whatever stage of life you're in, remember today the days of your li- youth, the, the creator in the days of your youth, before aging happens and then before this before death. Let me remind you that 100% of us are going to die. It's appointed unto death. Man wants to die and after that, the judgment. What's it going to matter? When, when, you, when you and I die, when you and I expire, what, what's going to happen in that moment when we are standing in the presence of Almighty God? What's going to matter when, when we are standing before him to give an account of our life? Everyone will be judged in that day. Solomon says, I who have everything this world could ever offer, I who have all the wisdom that anyone could ever accumulate, I who have all the workers that anyone could ever want, the only thing that's going to matter, Solomon says, is to have a relationship with God. He says, fear God, keep his commandments, because this is what it means to be human. You see what Solomon's doing? Solomon's going through the search for significance. How can my life matter? How how can I have full in my meaning? How can I have purpose in my daily life activity? And Solomon just simply says, the only way to make sense of all this emptiness under the sun is to have a relationship with the one who is above the sun. Now, remember now your creator. You say, well, that's a pretty big term, creator. Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God. Who is this creator? John, he picks up his pen in the New Testament, and he says that all things were made by him and for him, and there's not one thing that was made that was not made by him. Who is that, John? The one who was in the Word, who was with God, who was God, Verse 14, John 1, 14 says, the one who became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. The one uh, who entered into our world. Who, who is the eternal word of God? This is a, you can talk back to the preacher this morning. Who is the eternal word of God that John is speaking of here? Jesus Christ. 
Paul picks up his letter in the book of Colossians. We're about to study that verse by verse for the next seven weeks. Uh, but in Colossians, uh, Paul says that, uh, that everything that is visible and invisible, everything that is known and unknown, Everything was made by him and for him, and there's not one thing that exists that was not made by him. Speaking of Jesus Christ, and he says that he's the firstborn of all creation, that uh, he might have preeminence in all things. It's amazing as we look at this Bible. So what is Solomon in the Old Testament? He's telling us to remember our creator. What is he calling us to do? He's calling us to remember the one in which all of the scriptures converge that fulfill all the law and the prophets, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's very interesting, the word remember, again, remember, remember. Uh, in a mindless world, we need to take thought. We need to give our mind and attention to. What are we to do? The, the word here, remember, is an imperative. In other words, it's not up for debate. Don't, we don't get a vote upon it. It is something that we need to make a decisive decision concerning. And so tonight, this morning, in light of this text and in light of all of Scripture, I want to give uh, an urgency and a persuasion by the Holy Spirit to make a decisive decision. And if you have not made that decisive decision, may today be the day. May today be the line in the sand. May today be the day where eternity steps out of heaven into your heart. May today be a day that we would look back on this day, on May the 2nd, 2021, and say that was the day that I remembered, I made a decisive decision to remember my Creator. While you have opportunity, and really, if you're a young person this morning, uh, praise God for that. No better time to give your life to Jesus Christ than while you are young. Follow Jesus Christ while you are young. I committed my life to Christ when I was 12 years of age. And can I tell you, I've never regretted one single day living for Jesus. Never have. When I was a senior in high school, uh, they, they, I was one of those radical people. Carried my Bible to school every day. Tried to share Christ. Every opportunity, they would ask a question in my shop class, and I'd stand up and tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now he changed me. He said, well, Michael, that's not what we're asking. I said, well, that's the only answer I know. <laughs> I preached my first sermon when I was 17 years of age. Began to pastor when I was 20 years of age. You say, what? 20 years of age. And it's amazing. Remember now. Remember before you can't remember. Take thought now while you can't, before the days come when you're so busy and so consumed with the things of the world that you're uh, inoculated, you're, you, you're, you're isolated from a call of God. Three things I want to encourage you to do in the spirit of this text. First of all, make a decisive decision concerning Jesus. Make a decisive decision to follow Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. The, the text, if you want to write it in, some, some translations say, remember now. <laughs> remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Why, why is there such an emphasis in the text? Uh, because now is contrasted to tomorrow. Notice what the Bible says, uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, New Testament says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today... If you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness. Today, not tomorrow, not, not another time. Well, when I get around to it, when I think about it, in the future when I get married, when I have children, when I have grandchildren. No, he says, remember day. Why is that? Before your heart gets hard. There is such a thing that you could sit and even listen to biblical preaching and hear about the Lord Jesus Christ and even sing songs about him that pretty soon that your heart has just grown so uh, numb to the Holy Spirit that you can no longer hear his voice. When you get in that point, it's a dangerous time. The Bible says, we read this verse in our Bible reading uh, here last week, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2. 
For he says, an acceptable time, I listened to you. And at the day of salvation, I helped you. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. It's not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not another time. It's right now. I can't tell you uh, the urgency this morning of making the decision for Christ. What can you do today that you can't do when you're dead? Follow Jesus. Listen to me this morning. This will bring a lot of sobriety to what I'm saying. There's millions of people in hell that would give everything in the world to be sitting where you're sitting at right now. Listen to this statement. It's not popular, but today it is certainly biblical. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. There's a lot of people in hell that intended on giving their life to Christ, intended on turning from their sin, intended on uh, getting right with God, but their, they, their procrastination, they're putting it off, lying the way to hell. And I want to encourage you today, if you've Never made that decision. Why not today? Why not now? I mean, for God's sake, we're singing some great songs this morning. Amen? Uh, there is God that's in this house this morning. Why not today? Why not give your life? You see, the reality of this, this is, this is simple preaching, but it's biblical preaching. Listen to this. Jesus went to hell so that you and I wouldn't have to go there. Jesus died in our place upon the cross so that you and I could be forgiven, so that we could be cleansed from all of our guilt. I'm going to be urging you, and I'll be persuading you. You say, oh, Michael, why do you do that? Because if I had a thousand lives, I'd give them all to Jesus. And I, 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 I was troubled last night. I told my wife I was having a hard time sleeping last night. You know why? Because I think about those of you that sit and listen to me every single week, and I'm afraid that some of you will not be in heaven. It's not about having your name on a church roll. It's not about going through some ritual. It's not about being a Baptist or a Methodist or Episcopalian or whatever you want to be. It's not about being a Catholic or any of that. It's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus came to this world not to give dogma, not to give a relationship. Jesus Christ came into this world to give a relationship with God. You say, Michael, can you make sense of the Bible? What's the difference between this book and all the other religious books of the world? This book teaches us that God is reaching down to save man. All the other religions are man trying to reach up to find God. And right now, the voice of the Holy Spirit is being heard. So I want to encourage you today, remember, make that decisive decision to follow Jesus. If you have not yet done that, do that. Second of all, jot this down. Make a decisive decision to lead others to follow Jesus. I mean, we need to make a decision to remember to be mindful of this creator. And if you are following Jesus, to lead others to follow Jesus. Mark chapter 1 verse 17, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you to become uh, fishers of men. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 8, Paul writes to the first century church of Corinth. And notice these words, he says, everything is from God who's reconciled us to himself. Now, what does it mean to be reconciled? It's a change of relationships. You ever been in an argument with somebody and then you made up? That's called reconciliation. I love doing that in marriage, by the way. I love getting my hot tamale all hot and then we get all, you know, we get reconciled. Amen? Are y'all listening to me this morning? Get reconciled. God reconciled us. We were against God, and God made us his very friends and family to himself. How did he do that? Through Christ, who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them as he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God wants us to make a decisive decision to lead others to follow after Jesus. Let me encourage, first of all, start with you. 
You say, well, I, Michael, I'm just an average person working an average job or living an average life. Who, who am I? Listen to this statement. You, there, there is unlimited potential in and through you if you'll just avail yourself to lead others to follow Jesus Christ. One of our precious senior adult ladies said, Pastor, I heard your message several years ago, and, and, and I began to invite my neighbor over for tea. And then my other neighbors began to uh, drink tea with me. And now five of my neighbors are going to heaven. Uh, another uh, man by the name of Gene Laughlin, Liliana remembers him. Gene, uh, uh, I went down into his mechanic shop to share Christ. I had to cover my eyes because of all the posters, uh, pornography that was up on the thing. And I'll never forget, I shared the gospel with Gene. Gene fell on the floor before I could even give the invitation for him to trust Christ. Gene, after that, he had been married seven times, divorced. Gene began to invite all of his friends. He's getting baptized, invite all his friends, invite all his family to come. Pretty soon we were baptizing people that Gene knew from years back. I mean, they were, I mean, they were from a broken lifestyle. They were all coming to Jesus Christ. I talked to Gene not too long ago, 700 people he's led to faith in Christ since that day. This is just a South Georgia auto mechanic. Start with you. Then second of all, start with your family. If you are a parent, let me encourage you to share Jesus with your children. Share Jesus. It's not just, oh, maybe they might make that decision someday. No, share Christ with your children. If you're grandparents, share Jesus with your grandchildren. Make that a priority. I know uh, Liliana when. She was pregnant with each one of our daughters. She was reading the Bible to our daughters as they were in the womb. They came out of the womb. They were little toddlers crawling all over. She's reading the Bible to our, our daughters. I mean, uh, they, they were, uh, this week our daughter Hope called us and said, hey, Dad, today's my birthday. I said, no, it's not, a, not August 13th. She said, no, it's my spiritual birthday, Dad. They, oh, yeah, I remember uh, when you came to faith in Christ. Let me encourage you to, to do that. You say, well, well, you know, my son and daughter-in-law or my daughter and son-in-law, they, you know, they're sort of that. Well, look, when they're in your jurisdiction, give them Jesus. Amen? Uh, you're paying for everything else. Give them Jesus. <laughs> Share Jesus Christ. Uh, you, your parents, your parents. If you're a friend. Listen, if you know Jesus Christ, there is nothing better. I mean, the love of Jesus Christ is so much better. So share that friends don't let friends go to eternity without the love of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I, I'm afraid, you know, Michael, I, if I share Jesus with somebody uh, that they might be offended. Well, where are you going to offend them to? Hell number two, there's only hell number one. To share the gospel, share the good news, share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And let me address as a church, I was this week uh, doing what I do twice a year. I take a week to uh, prepare for my sermons. I've got my sermons prepared, hope for or planned out uh, where I'm going to uh, the rest of this year and into the next year. And you know what I sense from God? We have the greatest opportunity the greatest opportunity to the church. I'm telling you, now is the time we need to remember our creator. And now is the time we need to lead others to follow after our creator. I mean, we are sitting in a gold mine of evangelistic opportunity to reach a mass amount of people. Do you realize what happened this morning? We baptized a graduating senior of Georgia Tech, and then we baptized somebody from Nigeria. That doesn't happen in the average Baptist church. Amen? It's incredible. We have unlimited opportunities. We have hundreds of thousands of college students within the uh, circle of this steeple here. We have hundreds of thousands of internationals. And you and I have neighbors that need to know Jesus Christ. Now is the time you say, well, old, old pastor, they live 15, 20, 30 miles away. Thanks be to God they just put a, uh, an interstate, an express lane that gets off right here at Roswell Street. Have you noticed that? Amen? I have one of my friends that got here this morning, Fabio, who's a pastor of our Brazilian church. He said he lives way up in Canton. He said it takes me 10 minutes. I said, 10 minutes? Really? I said, how fast are you going? He said, oh, no, no, no. I take the express lane. He's here in 10 minutes from Canton. 
Let me encourage you. Invite people. Encourage people. If you've not made a decision to lead others to follow Jesus Christ, why don't you just say, yes, Jesus. Why don't we just do that this morning? We want to follow Jesus and lead others to follow Jesus. Let's just say, yes, Jesus. You, oh, that's weak. Y'all got to say it louder than that. Say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Amen. Let's do that. Let's follow Jesus. Let's lead others to follow after Jesus Christ. There's such negative vibes in this world. Let's give them a positive vibe of the love of God found in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then there's a third decisive decision to make, and that is to live for the glory of God. Make a decisive decision to follow Jesus. Make a decisive decision to lead others to follow Jesus. Make a decisive decision to live, to glorify God with your life. Now, Notice in verse number 8, Solomon comes to the end of his book and he says, futility. It's havel is the Hebrew word. Havel means, that's havel. It's it's meaninglessness. It's vapor. It is, he he speaks here uh, about uh, an absurdity or senselessness. What's the opposite of havel, futility in the Bible? It is kabod. What is kabod? Kabod is the glory of God. Instead of living for, live for kabod. Kabod is what is valuable, what is meaningful, what brings significance in life. And what is that? It is the glory of God. The glory of God. Why are you and I created today? Why are you and I living today? Why are you and I knowing Christ as our Lord and Savior? Why is that? It is for the kabod of God. It is for the glory of God. I love what Paul says. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Solomon says in these words, in chapter 12, he says, Well, well, when all has been heard, this is the conclusion. I, I love it, man. He writes all these chapters and all this emptiness that people are pursuing. This is the conclusion of it all. Fear God and keep his commandments because this is for all of humanity. Now think about it. This is a philosophical question. What does it mean to be human? Some would say, well, it means to eat. <laughs> means I'm going to drink. Means I'm going to provide air for my body. Well, you're physical, that's right, but To be human, what does it mean? There are a lot of people that have all that and they're still empty. Well, you say it means to fill your mind with books and facts and philosophies. and That's what it means to be human if you really grasp all of this. Many people have that. There's still an emptiness, a meaninglessness about them. Some say, well, it's all about emotions we got to have happy emotions. We've got to be joy-filled emotions. We've got to deal away with negative emotions. We've got to have, have these type of emotions. But a lot of people have all these good emotions and good vibes. But they're still empty. Something missing within their life. You see, you and I are more than just mind, will, and emotions. We're just more than just a body. I want to remind you this morning that you have a soul. You have a soul. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 9, he says that God has put eternity in our hearts. You know what that means? You can put everything you want in your heart and you'll never be satisfied in this world because there's nothing in this world that can fulfill a God-shaped vacuum. The only thing that can fill that is the creator going, and when you have that relationship with him, I'm telling you, life makes sense you say well how can you live for the glory of God let me lead you to an encounter with Jesus notice up on the ad mag screen this picture of Jesus upon the cross just reflect upon that we just partook of the Lord's Supper what we remember this morning question why did Jesus die on the cross we would say for our sins Let me ask you another question. Who did Jesus die for? Say it with me. He died for me. He died for me. You see, I love what Paul says in this verse. You're not your own. You've been bought 
with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. Give God the glory. Make a decisive decision. Maybe you've been living for futility and emptiness of hell. But today, God's calling you at the cross to pursue fullness. Because a life of self leads to emptiness, but a life of the Savior leads to fullness living for Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Up in the balcony, bottom floor, just stand with me. I'm going to ask our ministry team if they would come and find their place across the front of this auditorium. Our ministry team is here. We're just friends to lead and serve the church. And if God, the Holy Spirit, is leading you to make a decisive decision, I would invite you to make that this morning. I would invite you to make it right now. If you're here today and you say, you know, Michael, I, I've been thinking about pastor. I've been thinking about giving my life to Jesus Christ, following him, turning my back upon whatever I need to turn my back on and turning my life to follow Jesus. I'm going to ask you to make that decision right now. Now, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to come and take one of our ministry leaders by the hand and just simply say to them, I want to follow Jesus. We'll help you with that decision. There are others of you that would say today, you know, Michael, I, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm not leading others to follow Jesus. Why, might, why not make this a decisive decision today that no longer am I going to play the cultural Christian game? I'm just going all in, and I'm going all out for the Son of God. And if the Holy Spirit's leading you to make that decision, if you'd like to come and pray with one of our ministry leaders, uh, do that. If you'd like to come and kneel at this altar, this altar is open for you to come and pray this morning. And maybe this morning, Jesus is calling you to make a decisive decision. Remember the Creator. Before these bad days come, so that you could glorify God with your life. Maybe you've been living for self. You've been living for your own ways. You've been living for your own pleasure. But today, the Holy Spirit of God is calling you to go all in and all out to glorify Him with your life. I'm going to ask you if you will. If you're here in the building, every one of these aisles lead right down to the front. If you're up in the balcony, maybe the third heaven's up there, all these stairwells lead right down uh, to the bottom floor. I would invite you to move from where you're at to where God wants you to be and surrender of your life. Father, I pray that you'd give every man courage, every woman today confidence. Lord, of hearing your voice and doing what you're asking them to do. Father, I pray that as we begin to sing this song, that our hearts would respond to your heart. For we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.